On this episode of Big Boys Don't Cry, we discuss the film Mandy. You don't have to have seen the film to enjoy the podcast, but if you do listen without having seen the film, just be aware that there may be spoilers. Enjoy. Hello. Oh, Robbie, you came and you brought me a movie starring Nicolas Cage. It's groovy. (laughs) That was as far as I got. The rhyming in that makes it very difficult, actually. I was going to say, it's uh, a bit of a bit of a challenge. Um, Hello. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. That song will never fail to make me laugh. And once again, it's because of The Simpsons. Um. It's one of those instances where I'm aware of a thing in popular culture because it was on The Simpsons, but I actually have not ever experienced the real thing. And I'm aware that it's a song by Barry Manilow. Manilow. That's a hard word to say. But um, I've never heard it. And if I ever start hearing it, I'm going to put my fingers in my ears and go la 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 because I don't ever want to hear it because it couldn't possibly (laughs) be any better than the joke on the simpsons and again i don't we always say this whenever we make any simpsons reference but the joke works even if you don't know the song and sometimes it's even better for it right uh, yeah I, I know exactly what you mean the um the, the 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 key example of that as well is um the cape fear episode of the simpsons mm. which i'm sure has been seen by more people than the the original 60s one with gregory Perrett peck and the martin scorsese remake which is an amazing movie i don't know have you have you ever seen them no remake? i've never seen either of them ah okay but i take it you've seen the simpsons episode yes yeah <laughs> that's the one where he has a tattoo that says die bart die which is german for the bart the and and yeah and the the iconic scene where he keeps stepping on rakes yep um which unfortunately is not in the uh the 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 cape fear movies oh what um but yeah the, the in particular i mean the the original one is good but i think the the 1991 version directed by martin scorsese is truly wonderful it's a, a really horrible tense thriller um with with um robert de niro putting in one of his best performances all right um but also you know the the whole cast is fantastic you've got robert de niro you've got nick nolte you've got jessica lang you've got juliette lewis oh wow um it's uh it's yeah it's really good um and uh yeah well well worth watching but the plot is essentially exactly the same as the simpsons uh the simpsons parody um so if you've seen the simpsons parody you kind of know so it ends with a guy singing um gilbert and sullivan on a boat yeah exactly yeah it's a very very surprising end to a very tense movie um and then uh, a police officer arrests him and that's how it ends yeah um (laughs) exactly um but uh but cape fear is not this week's film no is the simpsons episode cape fear with an e this week's <laughs> film um we have started our halloween month and we started with a movie that you'd never seen i'd started watching it but wasn't in the right frame of mind for it right um, and it's a movie called mandy so was this around the time that it came out you were like i'm gonna check this out well, I was hoping it was going to come to my local pretentious art house cinema, but it never did. Oh, yeah. Um, they they were too busy showing Downton Abbey the movie or whatever oh, else. Boo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll have to but, talk uh, about that at some point, won't we? I've never seen it. I've never seen Downton Abbey. It looks like fucking shit. It's, um, <laughs> it's not usually the kind of thing that I would watch, but when it was first on, we watched like the first series, and that was quite good. As And... You know, it was one an example of one of these shows where the first series is good, and then when they get the second series, they don't know what to do. And it's like, yeah, all of the plot stuff that happened after that was just ridiculous and rubbish and boring. But the first series is actually quite good drama, and well acted, most importantly. But yeah, the film is probably total nonsense. And it's it's quite Tory, isn't it, Downton Abbey? When I watch things about the aristocracy, I like to watch things that are properly about the decline of aristocracy and them being weird freaks like the remains of the day 
<laughs> exactly, yeah. Like The Remains of the Day or The Little Stranger. Yeah. Um, which is a, an interesting movie based on a very, very good book. Um, but uh, did we have we talked about that? No, you brought it up the other yeah. day when we watched... This was only a few weeks ago. You mentioned it to me as being quite a good film. As we'd watched something similar. Maybe it was The Remains of the Day. I think it was either The Remains of the Day or um, Jane Eyre with Michael Fassbender. It might have had a similar vibe. That that it does have a, a a similar vibe. So yeah, it could have been one of one of either of them. But th- those are the kind of things I enjoy when it's about the decline of aristocracy. I don't I don't like the nostalgia for weird freaks that this country yeah. has. The aristocracy are a bunch of weird inbred chinless freaks, <laughs> and we should not feel sorry for them <laughs> under any circumstance. No, but you know, bigging them up is very much Julian Fellows' as a jam. So you know, there's, <laughs> it's always going to be like that. Oh, they're so noble. No, they're not. They were born into massive wealth. It's easy to be noble when you're born into massive wealth and they still fucking fail at it. They were born into massive wealth and it's really hard for them. It's so hard. Oh, our massive estate is declining because the money that we didn't earn is being drained away by the state. Wah! Wah! Too bad. They should have taken it earlier. You're lucky that you're not in France, mate. That's (laughs) all I'm going to say. Yeah. Off with their heads. Yeah, precisely. So, speaking of beheadings... (laughs) That, um, that was why I wanted to give you that link. See, <laughs> I knew you'd take that. Um, Mandy is exactly what I thought it was going to be, but also quite different from what I thought it was going to be. Right. Um, so when you started watching it, it hadn't come to the cinema. This was later on. This was later on, yeah. Um, where I, I watched it at home. Um, and to begin with, it's this very hypnotic, very slow um art house film and it, it is an art house film let's let's not pretend it's anything other than a bunch of pretentious prettiness yeah that it's just a bunch of pretentious prettiness with some massive violence at the end um it's, it's yeah it's what this movie is it, it's a two-hour psychedelic music video for like an ambient metal track yeah with <laughs> large chainsaws I want to see Sun Zero doing uh, doing their version of Mandy, where they just where they play a song that lasts the exact length of this, or Jizu, yeah, or, or Godspeed You Black Emperor, or something like that, which is kind of what it is anyway. When you listen to the the score by uh, Johan Johansson, um, it sounds it, like it those feels... bands tuning their instruments before a sound check. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> that's very that's unkind, but it's not it's, it's, melodic. It's very, is it? No, it's very atmospheric. It's very unnerving. Um, and you're right, it feels like a two hour long metal music video. and Metal machine music. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that that's kind of why I love it, is it is just that abstract. But yeah, the first time I watched it, I wasn't quite in the mood for something so abstract and, and so slow to get going. And I was so how like, far did you get? Uh, not particularly far because I realise, you know what, this is a movie that I will love when I'm in the right frame of mind. So I'll leave it until that happens. So I only made it about 20 minutes, half an hour in um, before I decided, you know what, this isn't, it, it's not working for me now. Let's give it another go later. And this was yep. later and it did work for me. Um, Good. I'm really glad. Did you enjoy Mandy? Yeah, I, I did. I really enjoyed it. I don't know that it's something I would necessarily ever return to. But for what it is, I I really really liked it. Yeah, I I think I was in the right frame of mind for it, and it was yeah it was good. And the fact that it was Nicolas Cage kind of made it a bit easier on the eyes, didn't it? In a, in a weird way, because if it's a bunch of people you've never heard of in some art house horror film, you, you're just gonna think, oh yeah yeah sure of course. Have your really really long dark everything's blood red psychedelic LSD film whatever you're not trying to make this accessible but because nick cage is in it somehow it feels accessible even though it's not does that make sense yeah i know what you mean um having that sort of star power in it does attract people that wouldn't necessarily see it and it does attach you to the movie in a way that doesn't always happen um another example of that is the film only god forgives um which have yeah you i've seen? not no i've not seen it it's ryan gosling right yeah i'm not a big fan of it um it's again extremely slow and extremely violent but it doesn't have the same impressive build-up that mandy has and although it's very pretty it just kind of plods along until it ends 
Right. Um, so it, it's got a good cast. You know, it's got Ryan Gosling and Kristen Scott Thomas. Uh, Nic- oh, right. Nicholas Winding Refn's a very good director. Um, the fellow who did Drive, uh, the Neon Demon. Yeah. Um, but it, the, yeah, it didn't quite work for me. And I remember I saw it in the cinema and there was lots of people there thinking, ah, oh, it's Ryan Gosling. Let's see this new Ryan Gosling movie. And immediately they were like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> um, <laughs> which which I don't necessarily think Nicolas Cage fans would feel the same way because I think Nicolas Cage fans are a slightly different breed, aren't they, to your average moviegoer? Yep. They're, you know, castle freaks. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. But you're right that he adds this kind of charisma and attachment to this film that often these kind of art house films don't get, um, which does make you think, okay, I'm waiting for Nicolas Cage to do something. So it allows you to fall that much easier into those very hypnotic, very slow earlier scenes where, to be honest, Nick Cage isn't in it very much. Yeah, I think it's actually almost less is more with Nicolas Cage in this film, isn't it? He's n- he, his amount of screen time, he's probably only on screen half the time. Yeah. But it's absolutely 100% his film, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, I think he he works well in this movie in part because of the other performances as well. Um, where, you know, um, it, it, I think everyone in this movie is good. I enjoyed everyone's performances. Mm. They're very... It's almost, people feel almost um, David Lynchian, don't they, in this film, Mm -hmm. in terms of being very over the top um, or incredibly matter of fact, and there's no middle ground. So you've got um, the sort of otherness of Andrea Riseborough's Mandy, for instance, who seems, you know, slightly concerned about these weirdos, but not overly, and then just kind of gets sucked into this horrifying world. Um, yeah. after being kidnapped um, but then you've got the actual cult themselves as well so so plot synopsis of this movie for people <laughs> as much as there is one don't worry about spoilers because we're, we're not going to give away you know sp- no, we'll give the general really, spoiler not really alert, a but it's not really, film, it's not really it? a plot film is it so Andrew yeah. Riseborough as Mandy and Nicolas Cage as Red Miller which would be a great name for like a, the other kind of movies that Nicolas Cage yeah. makes wouldn't it <laughs> um, they, we going, how can we get Nicolas Cage on board we need a good character name <laughs> Good, yeah. strong character name. Red, uh, yeah, uh, we're going to ask you to play the character Red Miller, Nick. And he goes, ah, oh, that sounds like exactly the kind of shite action movie I'd normally be in. And then he goes, sold. Movies. Don't uh, even know what the film is about. Sold. I'll do it. <laughs> and turns, I imagine he turns up on set and goes, what's this? Fancy lighting. A director who knows what the hell he's doing. This is yep. bullshit. This sounds like a good film. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> nice title sequences. Transitions with text calling it stuff like 80s films and stuff it's a bit like stranger things for people who pretend they can't watch anything on netflix because they're too highbrow for it (laughs) i mean i would i would say that this this fits into the same camp as um as the director panos cosmatos's other movie which we mentioned briefly on last week's episode as a sort of build up to this one uh, a film called beyond the black rainbow Mm. Um, which is very much a almost like a Kubrickian um, science fiction film, but again, it's it's using those kind of aesthetics to create an art house experience where it's sort of these waves of of art washing over you, creating this um, very odd an unnerving emotional impact um and that one's all about this person trying to escape from a a secret scientific facility um and to be honest stranger things kind of ripped it off a bit there's a scene there's one scene which is very very similar to the scenes where eleven does her weird hypnosis in the other place where it's all like a big void it's very very similar to that and i wouldn't be surprised if the creators of stranger things watch beyond the black rainbow um it's All it's right. it's um it's a, a similar thing happens in um i've forgotten the name of it but it's a scarlett johansson movie where she doesn't play ghost in the shell <laughs> where she doesn't play a non-white character I was lost in translation 
<laughs> um, I've forgotten what it's called. It's based on a book, and it's about an alien that comes down and um, uh, under the skin. It's called. She's an alien. Um, I've not but seen it, it. again, it's kind of like a. It's very abstract. It's directed by Jonathan Glazer, who's a, a very interesting um, director who does a lot of music. Oh, movies. he's one of those guys who bought Manchester United, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Despised by by people from Manchester, or rather, people who aren't from Manchester. Um, if you believe the 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 idea of who supports Manchester United, oh, football banter, Ooh. football, football. Um, he directed uh, Sexy Beast. Oh, right. Um, yes, that's right. Yeah, in which did. Ben Kingsley says no a lot of times. <laughs> exactly, but also uh, he he does a lot of music videos as well. So he did. Um, the Universal, the Blur music video. He did Street Spirit, the Radiohead song, uh, Virtual Insanity by Jamiroquai, Karma Coma by Massive Attack. Oh, yeah. Um, he did Karma Police, the one with the slow car getting set on fire by Radiohead. Video um, that's per- potentially even worse than the song itself. <laughs> somehow, even though it's vis- it's video and not audio, it's somehow even more of a dirge than the song. No, I, I, I like his videos a lot. I think they're good. Um, I'm not a fan of the song Karma Police very much, but I think his video is very good. Um, I mean, yeah. what could you do with that song? <laughs> fair make fair play to yeah. um, But yeah, so he, he then he made this very odd uh, sci-fi movie. And again, that Scarlett Johansson film has a scene that's very similar to that that bit from um from stranger things and it's clear that stranger things god bless stranger things i'm a fan of it but it's one of the least original it. things i've ever seen in my life it is literally just a bunch of references thrown together um, but i don't think it's claiming to be is it no but people fucking love it as this great original emotional work it's like it's not it's not come on you can admit that it's just a pastiche of various 80s things it's fine you can How dare that. people love things? You can accept that it's not the most the greatest thing ever, and that that's what annoys me about people in general. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's like you can you can enjoy something without making it your entire personality, you know, guys. It, it can, you can do that. You don't have to tie yourself to something that you like and get offended when people don't like that thing, as though it's an affront to your family, as though they've walked up to you and slapped you in the face. I know exactly what you mean, but if I catch anyone dissing any Castlevania game, I will, I will kill them. <laughs> Even Castlevania sixty <laughs> four. Yeah, no, that that is a really bad game. What about if I said Castlevania sixty four is better than Symphony of the Night? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be wrong, and I could send you lots of pictures of very blocky looking weird wolf monsters to prove it. <laughs> um, but yeah, Stranger Things is good. It's good, it's fun, it's enjoyable, it's not life life changing. But they're, they're working on the fourth season right now and that looks that looks good. What they should uh, I want have to see done. That. What they should have done is they should have made it into an anthology series. The end of the first series is so goddamn perfect. It's yeah. absolutely perfect. Take that cast, throw them into another Goonies esque thing that's going on. Make a completely different story for the second season. And I know that would have been a big gamble, but they should, that's what they watched should, it. They just made they, their money back. Yeah, that's what they should have done. I think it would have been really interesting if they'd done that. Um, just, just they could have done anything around. they wanted with it. They could have done, but instead they just kept kept making the same thing over and over again. And then they killed beautiful Mullet Man. Sorry, spoiler alerts for season three. Of, <laughs> of if you're a Things. big fan of the character Beautiful Mullet Man, Beautiful Mullet in your Man ears now. is the best character in Stranger Things series three. Um, and they, they bump him off so that fucking boy and girl can sing a stupid song for three minutes in the final episode and ruin all the tension fucking hate it fucking hate that (laughs) scene it's so shit and everyone loves it because people are shit people equal shit as said by the philosopher of our time guy from slipknot (laughs) um the man from slipknot and incidentally to link back to mandy when the the biker guys appear i was like oh look it's slipknot (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> they had and, a very Slipknot vibe about them. Yeah, uh, and, and that's that's the where I was getting to until I got distracted. Um, is that these 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 films that Panos Cosmatos makes? They're very original, but they use a sort of kernel of some kind of pop culture, uh, historic nostalgia piece that you have. So it might be those seventy sci-fi movies for Beyond the Black Rainbow, and here with Mandy 
it is those kind of splatter 80s horror films you know those yep. those biker demons they look really really hellraiser and that's there's a kind of... there's a bit of a Stephen King thread throughout it, isn't there? Like mm. she's reading a book that's clearly by like a Stephen King esque author, and all the the fonts and sort of this the vaguely trashy under underside of it is kind of like that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so it, it's calling back to this this era of horror, but it's doing it in a very interesting way. And but I th- it... I feel like he's also genuinely been influenced by like black metal as well. Because the the um, I read on the Wikipedia that the weapon that Nicolas Cage forges in the scene where suddenly he's a blacksmith now was based on the logo of the band Celtic Frost and like all of the metal music in the score and stuff. I feel like there's a th- and yeah the the way the demon guys look and sort of the theme- thematically there's a slight thread of the influence of black metal there and I really like that. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. This movie is metal as hell, um, and that's another reason to absolutely adore it um this is a movie with a chainsaw duel that's how metal it is it's an art movie it's a movie that makes you think but also includes Nicolas cage having a chainsaw duel get you a man who can do both and that man (laughs) is the film mandy get you a mandy who can do both (laughs) mandy definitely does it all (laughs) It, it, it is i've not seen anything quite like it i watch a lot of nonsense art house movies you watch a lot more of this kind of stuff than me so i was very interested to hear your perspective on it because i enjoy it but i don't know if i had seen a lot of stuff that was similar whether i'd be like oh well whatever yeah and i i think i think panos cosmatos has a very unique style um and that really holds him in good stead here um the guys made two movies eight years apart i mean that's 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 boyhood levels almost (laughs) isn't it i respect that um he knows what he wants to make he makes these um these these films that are very challenging but they're really interesting and you want to engage with them um and so yeah it's 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 great and and just just a little bit of a backstory to him his his dad um was george p cosmatos another yes. filmmaker who made a uh, cobra he made rambo first blood part two um the the not smart but most enjoyable rambo movie um and no, also i've never seen a rambo movie you've never seen a rambo movie the first one no. is actually a legitimately good drama there are a lot of gaps in my cinematic <laughs> thing rambo forrest gump you know um yeah the first rambo is legitimately a very good drama about this war veteran who comes home and gets bullied by the local police um it's it's like hardly anyone dies in it it's really really slow Um, hardly anyone dies in it boo (laughs) that's not what we want in october (laughs) um but then rambo 2 he i think rambo 2 he goes back to vietnam and shoots a load of people and then rambo 3 goes to afghanistan and shoots a bunch of people (laughs) um you know shooting people remains an intrinsic part of the rambo experience right. um, but the first one is genuinely quite a slow brooding film um but but um george picos matos he made two of my favorite movies ever not rambo first blood part two oh, really? not not cobra um he made the movie tombstone which is one of the best uh best westerns ever made um about the gunfight at the okay corral Oh, right. Um, oh, yeah, I'm looking at this now. With, I've seen with, this poster before. With Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer and Michael Bean. It's extremely good. Uh, genuinely fantastic movie. One of the one of the best movies of the 90s. Underrated as all hell. Truly brilliant with all these fantastic performances from its main cast. One of the best Val Kilmer performances as well. Um, but then he also made a less, uh, less good movie called Leviathan, which is what if the thing but underwater starring the guy who played robocop and ernie hudson it is I'm so good this. daniel stern it, yeah <laughs> marv from home alone yeah marv from home alone and the um, pitching coach from rookie of the year <laughs> it is it is extremely good um it feels like the thing but they're in some deep uh, mining uh, facility or something like that it's it's super great um and everyone should watch it it's a really underrated sort of sci-fi horror film um but yeah so it's interesting his dad made these very different movies and then he comes on the scene and just creates these bizarre 
um, bizarre, very weird movies that I absolutely adore. And I'm so glad that Mandy was good. I was very worried <laughs> that it wasn't going to be good. But it is, yeah, I, I really enjoy it. It's not for everybody, <laughs> I think it's fair to say. Um, but it is a, a fascinating, fascinating movie. Oh, that's really cool. But yeah, it's... it's it, it's I, I see what you mean, though, about it being a, a metal movie, because it does... it tonally matches black metal or doom metal doesn't it it feels very much like that yeah um it is the the movie equivalent of a of a post metal album almost isn't it yeah or you could imagine like this being like a dimmu borgia video or some band like that yeah yeah or emperor or someone like that yeah it's it's really um it's metal as fuck. What more can you say? And it even does that at the kind of the last bit when it it's had the sort of um, the title cards that flash up. It shows a logo that looks like one of those indecipherable black metal band logos, which I thought was a really fun touch. Yeah, that was that was great. And well. those kind of elements of the film, I thought, made it fun. When I think a lot of these films, kind of as you say, when they're a bit arty, end up taking themselves so seriously that you're just like, oh come on, you know, lighten up a bit. Yeah, and and I think what what helps as well is you know it does have that it does have that sense of fun it has that sensibility as well of of knowing exactly what it is but also things do happen not necessarily in the first half of the film yeah i don't think you ever um, did your plot summary because i interrupted you so <laughs> <laughs> right okay so yeah so plot plot summary um mandy and red they live by a lake. I a think lake that was called, as far as we got. Yeah, yeah, a lake called Crystal Lake, for any horror fans out there who get the obvious reference. I don't know if you get the reference. But no. Um, so Camp Crystal Lake is the name of the lake from the um, from the Friday the 13th movies. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so they live by Crystal Lake. Um, and um, But yeah, so they live there, and then there's some weird cult coming through who have these weird satanic sort of artifacts and they clearly have decided that that mandy is going to be the the new sort of uh wife of the leader of the cult who's basically a charles manson-esque weirdo yeah um and uh and so they they capture her they give her some drugs for some reason they get her to sting get stung by a tarantula hawk wasp um which is a very unpleasant scene which is they're, very disgusting <laughs> they're supposed to be aren't they meant to be the most painful bite or the most painful sting out of any creature is that right or something like that Ooh, i didn't um, know that but yeah but, the stinging creatures are one of the things i i do not like i do not care for those no uh <laughs> here's a here's a quote from a researcher about the pain of the tarantula hawk wasp sting which apparently they're they're pretty chill creatures but if they do sting you it's really gonna fucking hurt um yeah the, the researcher described the pain as immediate excruciating unrelenting pain that simply shuts down one's ability to do anything except scream <laughs> um <laughs> which yeah apparently yeah the only thing uh more painful is the bullet ant um which is so cool because its pain is like being shot <laughs> Uh, so don't get bitten don't get bitten by a bullet ant don't get stung by a tarantula hole. but yeah they they make her get stung by this and then I thought the bullet ant was something from mario <laughs> yeah exactly um and then uh yeah they uh the the leader of the hippie cult tries to seduce mandy she laughs at him because he's a fucking loser and you get fucking... to see his his funny little mushroom like penis <laughs> <laughs> you do yeah he's got a trumpian uh little dong doesn't yeah he? it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't like zoom in on it or anything but it, it did actually make me laugh when he's suddenly standing there and his dressing gown's open and you're like oh yeah there's there's his peen why not <laughs> exactly exactly you know it's what you want from a cult leader isn't it you want uh you want a, a tiny little chode dong yeah. um <laughs> you know there, there was none of that in um the master because paul thomas anderson was too afraid to do it yeah you loser what you've been out the, the virgin paul thomas anderson versus the chad <laughs> panos cosmatos <laughs> um but then uh the 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 cult leader charles manson jr uh doesn't take this 
uh, very well, so burns her alive. And in I, front of Nicolas Cage. In front of Nicolas Cage. And I was very surprised at this because I thought that this was, from what I understood, the movie was going to be him trying to rescue her from this cult. But instead, it's actually um, him getting revenge. Yeah. Um, and the revenge narrative, I think, is a powerful one in horror and in sort of romance as well, isn't it? Yeah, and and that that, that was a thing that it kind of took me by surprise because th- that's why I suggested this for the podcast was oh it's a story about Nicolas Cage rescuing his love from a bunch of weird satanic hippies, um, but instead it's him getting revenge, and I'm not. Sh- I do have, it does make me a little bit uncomfortable that this movie uses the old woman in refrigerator trope. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a shame that it does that. I mean, it, it's kind of used so much. I'm not going to hold it too much against this film that it does it, but it's still a bit like, oh, this movie's interesting in so many ways. It would have been nice if it had done something slightly different there. Um, but basically, yeah, she, she's burned alive. Uh, Nick Cage gets angry, gets his crossbow off um, his friend, uh, his friend played by, um, oh, I've forgotten his Bill name. Bill Duke. Bill Duke, right. that's right, who is wonderful as always. Bill Duke, um, the director of Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit. Really? Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. I know him as the fella from various Arnold Schwarzenegger movies um, and and other stuff. He's a, he's a he's a very good actor. I like him a lot. He's done a lot of um, directing as well, a lot of TV stuff, you know, like um, cop shows like Miami Vice and The Twilight Zone and stuff. He's, yeah, he's really, really oh, had an amazing oh. career. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he's uh, he, he's great. And and he's he's a, a tired, chill dude who's like, hey, Nick Cage, do you want your crossbow back? Here's your crossbow. Watch out. Those guys are very bad stuff. Yeah, um, they've got very, very potent LSD. They've got mega LSD. As soon as he LSD. mentions that, you know that Nick Cage is going to take some. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. So he turns up and kills some of the the weird demon people. Um. What are they called the the Black Skulls. Black Skulls. Yeah. yeah. Which could be a great name for a black metal band, anyway. Yeah. Um, Who, interestingly, the, the so the Jesus freaks carry them. Those are Nick Cage's words, not mine. They call the Black Skulls to do their dirty work, basically. So, and they use this like it really, really made me chuckle. He uses this like tiny little horn to call them. Yeah, it's <laughs> the a little ocarina, time. isn't it? It's, yeah. Uh, it's good. So, <laughs> he calls. He uses the horn of Gondor, and then the Black Riders <laughs> appear. And then, yeah, bad things happen. Um, but he he comes along, and uh, sorry if you you can hear that in the background. The cat's decided she wants to come in and use her scratching post. I um, can't hear anything. <laughs> okay, that's all right then. Um, so yeah, so he decides he's going to go fuck him up, and he does. He does a lot of murdering demon bikers. Um, <laughs> then he uh, he finds in in one of the demon bikers' kitchens, he finds a jar of grey goop um and decides i'm gonna eat this <laughs> great idea nicholas cage he has a big old hallucination because he he ate weird gray demon lsd goop that he found in a kitchen um kids don't do that no if you find Bad yourself idea. in the kitchen of a, a demonic biker gang just get the hell out of there yeah don't eat the goop you know Wasn't, not yeah, a good was, idea frank zappa sang that song for a reason <laughs> Don't exactly. eat that grey goop. Don't eat that grey goop. Um, so, uh, and then he just continues murdering them. He 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 lets one of them survive. Um, you know, I think I think it's hinted earlier on that she's also been brainwashed rather than is a, uh, a clear member of the cult, which I think is again another sort of hint towards uh, Charles Manson being the point of reference. Yeah. Um, and then he throws a decapitated head at the leader, who then starts crying. And then he crushes his skull. Uh, yeah. And that's basically the end of the movie, apart from everything's turned to hell. And that's uh, that, that, that's the, the story of Mandy. It's a complex movie. There's a lot of spinning parts in that plot. Um, definitely not just Nick, Cra- Nick Cage gets angry, does demon LSD, crushes a man's skull. Yeah. Because there's also a very a long scene of him in his pants in the bathroom shouting. I'm roaring. 
<laughs> which is exactly what you want. And to be fair, I feel like that scene is a very good and unique way of in, of, of showcasing grief, isn't it? Because it's when he's sort of got back out and he's realized that Mandy's dead and he's just really furious and and broken and yeah he's screaming in his pants yeah but it but it works doesn't it the film spends a really good amount of time on it actually sort of after the the bad stuff happens like he's been stabbed and tied up by these these guys and they've like burned his girlfriend in front of him and tortured him and then they let him go and he just sort of stumbles into his house and he's just sort of standing there and then he goes into the bathroom and starts roaring and drinking vodka. And it's just like, yeah, that would be your reaction. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's yeah, it's, uh, it is, it's interestingly done, I think. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's powerful. And yeah, this movie's fun. Don't get me wrong. But it's also quite serious. It doesn't take itself seriously, necessarily. It knows that it's over the top. But it's not playing it for laughs at all. There's no real comedic moments apart from if you're a sicko like me and laugh <laughs> at the guy crying when a decapitated head gets thrown at him. Yeah. Um, it, it's pretty, pretty, pretty sombre, I'd say. It is. What, what it, it doesn't have comedy, but what it does have is levity. And I think that's what I was getting at when I was talking about kind of the the heavy metal moments and the Nick Cage kind of roaring stuff. Like it knows that it's a bit ridiculous and it sort of, it it doesn't, it takes itself just seriously enough, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and you're completely right. There's levity, not comedy. Um, that's the, that's the perfect way of, of describing it. It's, um, yeah. And like the cult leader, he's like a ridiculous figure, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. He, he feels like, he feels like the villain of a gang in an 80s horror movie. Yeah, you know? and, and, and the fact that she that... laughs at him as well brings some levity to it as well. Her response yes, to him is yeah. to be like, you're just like a ridiculous guy. I'm not scared of you. Yeah, he, he's not. He himself is not an intimidating figure, but um, the the power that he holds over other people is incredibly dangerous. Is um, yeah, is, is essentially sort of the, po- the point of it. Even the biker guys are slightly hilarious, aren't they? There's this demon, the weird <laughs> black costume demons. Yeah, they are. They're 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 silly. They're they're all. It, it's all it's all very over the top. There's, the there's Slipknot like most... nature of them is very funny. And like, there's a the the when they speak again, it's all in kind of low low computerized blah, 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 voices, and it's just like, <laughs> yeah, of course that's how they talk. Oh, precisely. How else would they talk? Let's be honest um it's um yeah it, it's all over the top there's no subtlety in this film it's all extremely on the nose um and there's like a fake advert on the tv of a cheddar goblin cheddar <laughs> goblin, cheese yes. pasta everywhere that's that's is funny isn't it yeah exactly and 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 it's um and again it's trying to set that kind of time period as well um you know this is a this is a movie that's at some indeterminate point in a nostalgic past. Um, I don't know if they ever explain what year it's in. Doesn't it, didn't it say it was 1983? Does it say that? Right. I think it says that at the beginning. Um, Because I think it's set the same year as um, beyond the black rainbow. Right. uh, Which, which is yeah, very 80s set. Um, And um, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's yeah, it's, it feels it feels like it's of that time, but at the same time, there's so much uniqueness that it feels fresh. This isn't a pastiche. This isn't this isn't Stranger Things. It it has its own unique tone and style, um, and the plot isn't going to move you, but you're going to feel some kind of emotion to it, if only because you're watching Nicolas Cage scream as he kills someone with a chainsaw. Um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's very evocative, I guess is the best word for it. Yeah, definitely. And there's not loads of dialogue, is there? Most of the talk comes from the cult leaders doing their weird cult thing. The rest of the characters are all pretty silent, aren't they? And just sort of grunt their way through most of the scenes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they mumble a bit, they grunt and they, uh, get horribly murdered. So that's, there's, that's all there is. 
Yeah, so there's not like loads to get hold of from that perspective, from the character perspective necessarily. The characterization comes from the situations and the performances and how Nick Cage handles himself, and it's it's Nick Cage. It is, yeah. He is he is on point. Nick Cage, when you know how to use him, oh, he's a he's a good one. Um, when you don't know how to use him, it can go horribly wrong. But this is a movie that really works to his skill set, doesn't it? Yeah, but at, at the same time, you know, it's it's a film that washes over you, isn't it? It's partly partly a spectacle, isn't it? Not in the way that you know you'd say like something like James Cameron's Avatar or something is a spectacle where it's the that over there being a plot. There is a plot here, but the spectacle element of it, I think, is really important as well. But that comes from a, a psychedelic place, doesn't it? Which is very different. Yeah, this is a it's it's. It's a you're you're right. It's a different kind of spectacle. Um, it's it's um, it's something that you just kind of, and that's why I wanted to go see it in the cinema. Is this is a very visually compelling experience? You know, mm. the lighting in particular is phenomenal. There's lots of red, but that doesn't really do justice to um, to, to what it's like to actually watch this film. And I'd even, have loved even, to have seen it in the cinema. Yeah, even even just looking at screenshots of it, it's not. It's not enough to um, to to show exactly how beautiful and flowing and sometimes horrifying this movie is. Yeah, we're sorry, Panos Cosmatos, that we didn't watch it how you intended. <laughs> no, I, I watched it on the toilet on a small iPhone. That's how. No, I did watch it on the TV. Um, but I, I didn't have the opportunity. God damn it! Our bloody the only cinema around us that would have likely shown it. Um, was too busy showing other shit instead, so we didn't get to see it. Um, and one thing I did want to bring up is that Nick Cage this year was in a movie called Willy's Wonderland, <coughs> where he is a man who doesn't speak a lot, who wants vengeance and kills shit. And on the surface, you'd think, and again, it's got a very historic horror movie feel to it and so you think oh yes on the surface if a robot was looking at these two movies they'd they'd think oh yes these two films are similar but actually they're they're very very different and willie's wonderland is quite bad sorry oh really for sorry people who like it but it's not good you're only liking it because you think wacky nick cage performance equals good but it's not it's 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 quite a bad film um there's there's some very funny moments not heard of it um so Basically, do you do you know Five Nights at Freddy's? Vaguely, um, it's a, a a game series made by someone who gives most of the money to horrible conservative organisations. Bad bad fella, yeah. That all came out in the press this year, and he immediately was like, "Well, I'm not going to make any more games anymore because of cancel culture." It's like, fuck off. <laughs> um, you're you're giving money to actual horrible uh, Republican politicians. And what's funny is that Five Nights at so Five Nights at Freddy's, right? Sorry. Um, before I get into the politics of the absolute dickhead who makes it, um, is a series about this guy who takes a job as a night watchman at a Chuck E. Cheese style restaurant. And oh, it turns that's out, right. It turns out that the animatronics get up and walk around at night and kill you if you're not careful. And it became this huge phenomenon uh, in horror gaming. Uh, they then sold the rights. I did hear about this being a Nicolas Cage thing. They, yeah, they sold the rights of Five Nights at Freddy's to make a movie, which is still in the works. It's trundling along, but in that time, there's been two movies that are knockoffs of Five Nights at Freddy's that have already come out, uh, one of which is Willy's Wonderland. So a bunch of kids break into a Chuck E. Cheese, but not a, a, a Naughty Cheese. Do you know um, what the E in Chuck E. Cheese stands for? Uh, I don't know. No, what is it? Entertainment. Chuck that's true entertainment cheese. that's true and the mascot it's like a ma- big mouse mascot and you know you're only you're not allowed to dine there without children really they'll, they'll like just... turn you away if two ad- like you as two adults just want to go somewhere and have a meal and you turn up at a chuck e cheese they'll they'll they won't let you in that's horrendous i yeah. want to go to a chuck e cheese now we should go you and me i'll dress up like a child yeah, I mean, we, we could we could just bring your child along. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but, it wouldn't have to be a problem because I do have a child. But, like, but that's beside the point. Yeah. The one so, thing yeah, I would say... The mouse's say, name is Charles Entertainment Cheese. 
the one thing I would say is that they've redesigned Charles Entertainment Cheese now. So it's no longer the creepy animatronic weirdo that was oh, there. And now it's just some generic CGI mouse. Oh, I don't want to go anymore. <laughs> I don't know if the horrible animatronics are still there. I certainly hope so. Um, There's but, probably uh, a few branches of it in the you know, the backwaters, you know. In small towns, I reckon they've not bothered to do the refurb the head office I, told them to do and like, nobody checks. Not. I hope not. Um, but yeah, so so um, so Charles Entertainment. He turns yeah. up at at um, Henry Entertainment Hippo's uh, pizzeria, um, and uh, by the time he gets there, a bunch of kids have already broken in and are starting to party and start getting killed by the animatronics. But turns out Nicolas Cage is there for revenge for something. I think his mum got killed by the animatronics or something like that. Uh, <laughs> the, several um, years earlier. Some animatronic Dalmatians pushed his mum off a cliff. <laughs> exactly. Um, and yeah, for, somehow he gets like, uh, he gets the job as the night watchman there, which definitely isn't like Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> Um, so he turns up and then he starts just murdering these animatronics um and there's these weird sections where he goes off to play pinball in the back room and he does it like three times like after every animatronic that he murders he pops off into the back room to play pinball and drink cola okay Um, and (laughs) the scenes go on uncomfortably long and it's clearly trying to do like a bad b-movie thing but you know how when a movie tries to do that it's always considerably worse Mm -hmm. like the Sharknado movies, for instance, which are oh, they're yeah, not they're yeah. not fun B movies. They're just shit, and they try to get around being shit by making it like an old B movie. Um, it's it's got that kind of feel to it. And, and actually, so, you're not trying. No, no, and and that's a movie where yeah, Nicolas Cage is entertaining because he's always entertaining, but you don't get the quality of his acting that you get from uh, from Mandy, where he fits the film perfectly. Yeah, um, he's not been given some dumb script and told to goof it up, has he? he he's been no, told this no. is, you know, this is an arty film with some levity, and we want you to give it your all, and he does. And he, he exactly, he he gives it his all, and it's a really, you know, maybe powerful is not the right word for it, but it is a is a strong performance from him. Yeah, it's moving in a way, I'd say. Yeah, I, I'd I'd say so as well. I think it's a movie about revenge and about grief and apparently he said that his his wife had had just his his marriage had just ended at the time of filming and he used that sort of catharsis oh, wow. into his performance um which yeah it's it's a very raw performance from him and it's it's you know it's it's not got a lot of dialogue but it's got a lot of emotion yeah it's sort of an abstract take on catharsis isn't it yeah, and a heavy you know, metal catharsis. What's better for catharsis than murdering a demon biker with a fucking great big axe and a crossbow? <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I thought his performance was fantastic, and I I think you know the more I see of him, and the more we we look at these kinds of things, I think um, he's a great actor. You know, he is. He is. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to call out Andrew Riseborough, who is oh, yeah. always great in everything. Um, this makes two movies. The last two movies I've seen with her in have both been slightly abstract sci-fi horror films. Because she's also in Possessor, which I think I wax lyrical. About You've mentioned on, that before on yeah. a previous episode. It's super good. Everyone should watch Possessor, um, unless you don't like horrible films in which case don't watch possessor because it is a truly in which case you're probably not listened to 45 minutes of this episode (laughs) yeah you've probably (laughs) decided all right they talked about a chainsaw duel very early on this movie's probably not for me um but yeah it's yeah she she's great and i think she's she's one of the a real underrated talent in, in cinema at the moment um you know she deserves to be in some great great stuff and get all the awards but alas She's been in loads of um, loads of really good stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. She's yeah, she's she's brilliant. So um and yeah, this is another example of it where everyone does their part in this film to create this atmosphere that 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 the film wants you to feel. Yeah. Um but yeah, so Mandy, it's a good one, I'd say. It is a good one. Yeah. And a good one to kick off as well, something a bit different, you know, again not not a shit piece, not too goofy, not not too horrible very metal yeah. you know i <laughs> like that it's, it's the just right bowl of heavy metal porridge yeah 
Um, so is, is there anything else you want to say about, about Mandy? No, I, I think I've, I think I've covered it. But from the, at one point he says to one of the demons, you're a vicious snowflake. <laughs> and that really made <laughs> me is, laugh. Yeah, it's a great line. Um, need to use that more. Oh, and he, he also says, I'm your God now to the guy, which is a very <laughs> heavy metal line. It is. That is the name of a song, I think, by Machine Head. Oh, is or it? if that's not the song, that's like the refrain from the song that people always chant at Machine Head concerts. It's, it's one of those oh, kind of things. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, and yeah, it's it's every line of dialogue could be a heavy metal song name, couldn't it? Yeah. Um, Jesus Freaks, for instance, could be. Um, <laughs> uh, arrows cutting through bone like a fat kid eats cake. Yeah. <laughs> Is something that Bill Duke's character says. That's a lyric from a yeah from a Opeth song, probably. <laughs> probably, um, you ripped my shirt as well. <laughs> something that he shouts. Um, it's uh, it's yeah, it's uh, it's a good movie for random non sequitur dialogue, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think the scene where where Mandy just starts laughing at Colt Man is going to live long in my memory where she doesn't just laugh at his his tiny tiny little chode cock <laughs> but also at his terrible music which again is very charles manson isn't it he yeah like it when people made fun of his music his bad music may i point out um, yeah it's terrible hippie folk nonsense yeah because because people always go about oh you know he was hanging out with the beach boys and oh what would have happened if charles manson had made music properly would it have stopped him and maybe he's like a lost talent no his songs were shit guys fucking hell <laughs> yeah it was fucking terrible it was like that the whole thing of the reason that fidel castro turned into a revolutionary was because he wasn't allowed to play baseball have you heard that one <laughs> yes I have. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um it's yeah he's he's uh he's he's uh he's he's bad he's bad as old charlie manson um it's uh yeah he's uh he's just a not very good musician no now he's dead what does that tell you about <laughs> yeah a better musician would have lived and become a member of slipknot <laughs> exactly <laughs> why is why is uh why is charles manson not a member of slipknot because he's not a good enough musician That's yeah key not because away. he's dead <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly exactly um i'm just gonna try and find i want to try and find some some charles manson lyrics oh god so people can le- know exactly how bad he was um let's see i'll see if i can find some but if not just take my word for it listeners he's a he was a bad musician i i think we can all we don't need to hear it hear his music to know that <laughs> What to know he was a bad musician. Yeah. Yeah. I mean also he was a weird looking fella. Yeah. Didn't have much going for him really, did he? He didn't, no. Um but yeah. Uh the the yeah, the fella from, from Mandy. Pretty good pretty good version of uh of, of a Charles Manson esque person. Yeah, definitely. The scene when you first see him when he's kind of lying down and insulting all his cult members. That was very the very good introduction of the character. I thought. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it really sets the tone for, um, for for what what that cult is going to be about, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, it's very very powerfully done. And then when he just completely flips to completely like a whimpering little scared puppy before Nicolas Cage kills him, is yeah, that's that's well done, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's it's really well done. The the facade of this character without the other people around him um really really works um incredibly well um so yeah it's uh it's it's a decent decent fleck is old mandy there's a lot more going to it than you might think at first glance absolutely yeah there's, there are layers to it you know I, I i really really enjoyed it on a number of different levels and the romantic element is really central to it and really works as well you believe their their love and his his revenge um, yeah, it it works on a number of levels, and I think it's great. Obviously, if you're not into psychedelic horror stuff, then it's probably not for you. But it's if you're if you have an open mind to this kind of stuff, I think you'll really enjoy it. Yeah, one hundred percent. Are you going to go and find Beyond the Black Rainbow then? Yeah, that sounds really good. Else? 
I don't, I don't, we, well, we definitely can't watch that for the podcast. There's no, there's zero romance in it, but I feel like we should watch it at some point anyway, just because it's, it is a very good film. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, have you got anything else you want to say about Mandy? No, or... just that it's, it's good and you should see it. It is good and you should see it. Um, just one bit of trivia for you. Um, the chainsaw fight had to be filmed in one night and Panos Cosmatos described it as a straight up living hell to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Did they actually have a real like long chainsaw? I assume so. Yeah. I don't think that's CGI. I think they just had a big old long, big old long, uh, long chainsaw. That's great. Um, but yeah, so, um, how are we going to rank Mandy then? Let's see. Well, how, how many black riders are there in your your demonic biker gang? Oh, so I've got a, a, a pretty big gang. I've got 15 uh, motorbikers in my gang. Demon, demon bikers. Nice. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with that. 15 is um, good. 15 out of 20. Yeah, it's, it's a very good film. I'm taking marks off because it is not as romantic as i wanted it to be nicholas so, cage killed five of your your riders <laughs> he killed and the rest five survived. of my riders and the rest ran away um but yeah it, i think it yeah for the for the for this podcast i don't think there's enough of the relationship in there so i'm knocking some points off for that but it is a very good movie it's hard to it's hard to rank a film like this isn't it yeah it is um potato out of beef is, is how i'd rank it doesn't feel fair instance. to compare it to m- many other films does it no no um but it is a it is an interesting film and if it is sort of your cup of tea i'd say give it a go yeah please do um but up next we're taking a, a turn more towards what we're used to um it's still spooky but Ooh. we're going to be watching the movie extraordinary extraordinary Yes. I've not heard two of this. Words, two words, extraordinary. When was this made? Uh, in 2019. Extraordinary. Yeah, I've never heard of this. Have you seen it already? I have seen it already. I very much liked it. Okay, there's a there's a sheet ghost on the cover, so sold. <laughs> it's my, my costume every year. That's how I love what I love to do. So yeah. This looks fantastic. It's it's it's, it's yeah, well I enjoyed it a lot. We'll see whether you enjoyed it as well. But um, but yeah, I think uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing what you think about it. Sweet, this looks great. Brilliant stuff. Cool. All right. Well, we hope you enjoyed Mandy if you watched it, and if you didn't, we hope you'll give it a go. And you know, we're very very pleased that this is the first of is it five spooky spooky romance films. Yeah, it's going to be five this year. Yeah, the way the, the the way the weeks fall. So we've got some really great stuff lined up for you, and we're really really excited um to be kicking off this halloween month so you can find us on twitter at big boys don't pod you can email us big boys don't cry podcast at gmail.com there's a link in our show notes to where you can give us money it's like a tip jar and we'll be back next week to talk about extraordinary Alrighty, bye-bye. bye bye